now. The next talk is on semantics for three different instruction set architectures. And I have to mention that this paper already became famous on Twitter as the most epic popple crossover of all times. Alasdair Armstrong is going to present it. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for coming. I'm going to be talking about uh, ISA semantics or instruction set architecture semantics for ARM V8A, uh, RIS 5, and uh, Cherry MIPS. And uh, yes, this is the paper at Popple with uh, the most authors, apparently. Um, so some of our colleagues at Cambridge, both at, both at Cambridge now and who've been at Cambridge previously, as well as uh, colleagues at the University of Edinburgh, as well as people we're working with within ARM, uh, as well as uh, SRI, Prashant Munker is helping us with some of the RISC-V stuff. Okay, so uh, what is an instruction set architecture and uh, what's the problem with instruction set architectures? Well, I have this picture here, um, which I found on Google, which I think summarizes both what an instruction set architecture is, as well as what the problem with instruction set architectures is. So instruction set architectures are typically this sort of large mixture of prose and pseudocode that you'd find in sort of a giant book like this. Um, many, many thousands of pages. I don't actually know how many thousand pages all these Intel manuals are. And these manuals, they're sort of often quite loosely worded. Um, they can, you know, contain errors, as you can imagine, something that size. So I believe you could go through these books and you could try to find all sort of the nine-bit bytes. Um, that might be a fun thing for somebody to do. And if you don't have machine-readable specifications, so if you just have like a paper specification, there's some things that you just aren't able to do. So you can't do machine-checked proofs. Um, it's very hard to test or formally verify implementations of one of your processors against an actual formal specification if you don't have a machine-readable, executable specification. So of course, I can't talk about this without mentioning all the previous work in this area. So I picked three projects that I think the kind of popular audience will be very familiar with. But of course, there are many, many, many others. And I don't, you know, I don't want to leave anyone out. But so for example, the KML project, um, so things like compilers, so CompCert as well. Um, people are writing verified compilers. Obviously, they need some kind of instruction set semantics for the back end of their compiler if they want to verify it. Of course, there's also the SEL4 operating system. Um, and they use a ARM v7 model, as far as I'm aware, we're using Isabel. Um, KML uses Hall 4, and uh, CompCert uses Coq. But the thing about these models is they're often they're tied to specific use cases. So as I mentioned, um, compiler writers might only be interested in specifying the subset of the instruction set architecture that their compiler actually uses. If you look at an actual instruction set architecture, it's going to contain lots of instructions that you know the average C compiler just wouldn't generate, right? So the other thing is a few of these models have sort of system level features. And what do I mean by system level features? Well, they're sort of features that are you know, going to be used by operating systems. So things like virtual memory, like address translation, um, that kind of thing. So sort of higher sort of hypervisor mode, for example. Like if you're specifying an instruction set architecture for a compiler, you're probably not going to formula, you know, uh, formalize the kind of the hypervisor mode of the processor. It's, it's just not something you'd be interested in. So one of the things that's relevant, um, or we're particularly interested in, is particularly relevant to this talk, is there's been a public release of the ARM v, V8A specification by ARM. Um, but ARM, they released the specification, but, and you can download it. There's a big pile of XML with sort of pseudocode in it. Um, and they have tools within ARM for dealing with this, uh, but they don't release, there's no sort of public tool support uh, available for that. So this picture here, this is sort of our view of the world, and it's also sort of your view of the rest of my talk. Um, so we have at the top these different instruction set architectures, which I sort of had on the title. So ARM, RIS-5, MIPS, Cherry MIPS. Previously in some earlier work, we've also done some stuff with Power and x86, but I'm not going to be sort of talking about that now. Um, so what do we want at this level? Well, we really want our models for these architectures to cover the full scope of the architecture. We're really interested in everything that the architecture contains. Um, and in particular for ARM V8A, what we do is we generate it from the ARM specification using a tool we wrote called ASL to sale. And then as you can see, there's kind of this many to many problem where we have many different architectures and we also have many different uses uh, for this architecture. So we have a language called sale, which sort of bridges these two things and sort of solves this kind of many to many problem. So one of the goals we have for sale is we also want our language to be able to be used to sort of document these architectures. So for example, for the Cherry MIPS architecture, which is a research architecture at Cambridge, um, 
the upcoming Cherry ISA V8, I believe, document is going to contain sort of SAIL pseudocode. And we've also produced a version of the RISC-V documentation, which contains SAIL as sort of the pseudocode in the documentation. And then at the bottom here, we've got this sort of large pile of things, which all the things we want to be able to do with our instruction set architectures. So we want to do testing and validation. So one of the things hardware people really like is they really like it when you can generate tests from your specifications. So they can test their actual hardware. We also want to build emulators so we can run test suites. We can test our specifications. As I'll come to in a bit, these specifications themselves are very large. We also want to generate idiomatic theorem prover definitions because we want to be able to prove things about these specifications. We don't want to limit ourselves to just one tool. So we want to have you know, these specifications be available to users who are using Coq, who are using Isabel, who are using Hall 4. So whatever tool you're using, we would like it if you, know, if you were able to use our specifications. And one of the sort of earlier uses of SAIL, previous work, was about memory models. So we want our sort of ISA definitions to link into kind of weak memory work and be able to use, sort of be used for that purpose as well. So I'm now going to go over some of our models. So we have uh, in the paper, we were working with ARM v8.3. And we had a public version of ARM v8.3, which didn't include any system level features. Um, so that's about 23,000 lines of code. Um, we have now, as of last Friday, we've just released, um, with ARM's permission, a full ARM v8.5 release, um, which is about 100,000 um, lines of source total. And using that, we can boot Linux on it. So it's complete enough to boot an operating system. And to the best of our knowledge, this is kind of the first time uh, formal specifications have really been used to boot um, production operating systems like FreeBSD and Linux. Um, we also have, as well, we have smaller handwritten models for RISC-V, MIPS, and Cherry MIPS. Uh, but those models are also complete enough. They have enough privileged architectural features that they can also you know, boot operating systems and you can sort of reason about sort of system level features of the architectures. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about our ARM model uh, in a bit more detail because it's kind of the biggest, it's sort of the, the most interesting, at least to me. So this is described, like I said, using this ASL executable pseudocode language that's used within ARM for all sorts of things. So documentation, hardware validation, architectural design. So what's really exciting about this, at least for us, is that this is sort of an authoritative vendor supplied semantics. And this isn't something like the sort of community who's interested in these kind of things has really had before. So what we do with it is we have a tool called ASL to sale, very imaginative, which takes this ASL and translates it into our language sale. And this specification has sort of all the features of the architecture, right? So I have this big list on the, on the slide, which I'm not going to read them all out, but you know, things like we have all the vector instructions, and there's two different sets of vector instructions in the ARM architecture, pointer authentication, hypervisor mode. So if you're interested in verifying hypervisors, this has sort of all the stuff you need. And again, sort of reiterate, this is something that hasn't been sort of previously available for formal reasoning until ARM kind of released this to the public. And now we have a version you can download and hopefully actually, actually use. So I wanted to give it a bit of scope for sort of how big this specification is, uh, how, kind of how complicated it is. So the 64-bit subset of that large 100,000 line specification I was talking about earlier, the 64-bit instructions uh, take up about 66,000 lines in total. Um, that makes up about 3,825 functions in sale. There's about 561 registers. Um, and there's 981 sort of machine instructions, which could correspond to kind of multiple assembly instructions. So the kind of takeaway point here is that sort of these kind of large realistic models are sort of more complex than you imagine. Like these aren't sort of small, elegant calculi. These are sort of big and they're ugly. And in some ways, that's kind of what makes them interesting. So here's a statistic that I um, calculated while booting Linux. Um, the average instruction in the ARM spec makes about 800 calls to auxiliary functions and calls about 500 primitives sort of over the course of executing it. And that's things like when you're executing an instruction, you might have to you know, check the exception level. Um, you have to do address translation. So you might have to do multiple levels of address translations. So there's all this extra detail that goes on um, that you know, a smaller, simpler handwritten spec might not cover. So we've got this giant model. We've translated it from ARM's model. So we want to kind of make sure that it actually works. So one of the things that's been made possible by our collaboration with ARM is that we're able to take our specification and we're able to give it to Alistair Reed within ARM. And he's able to run the ARM architecture validation suite 
uh, on our model. So this suite is sort of the authoritative, what it means to be an ARM processor. So when Apple or whoever is making their new ARM processor for the new iPhone or whatever you have, um, this is the sort of the test suite that they have to pass in order to really be an ARM processor. So for the 8.3 model in the paper, we pass about 99.85 of 15,000 tests as compared with the ARM ASL implementation. Um, that excludes some tests that rely on features that we didn't implement at that time. So we're now working on our 8.5 model. So we've been testing that in the past couple of weeks. We've got that up to about 96%. Um, that contains more features. That's why it's a bit lower at the moment. As you can maybe tell from the cute little picture of Tux I have here, we also test the model by um, booting Linux on our model. Um, so this is kind of a useful sanity test for the system level features in the, in the architecture. Um, so to do that, we have to implement a few extra things. We have to implement sort of an interrupt controller and a sort of a UART. Um, but I kind of have an interesting statistic about this, is that when you boot Linux on this model, it actually only covers about 25% of the 64-bit instructions, not counting the vector instructions. So you might think that this is like a really good test, but actually Linux, so I mentioned that compiler writers might only target a small subset of instructions. Linux only uses about 25% of the architecture, at least during the boot process, right? So there's all this extra stuff in, in the model that you know, we want to talk about. And if you're doing things like security proofs, you might really care about all those instructions because a malicious attacker, you know, they're not going to restrict themselves to some nice subset of the instructions. OK, so the other models we have, I'm going to go over these quite briefly, but we have a RISC-V model, and we sort of validated in very much the same way as I just described. Um, so on the RISC-V model, we can boot SCL4, um, FreeBSD, and Linux. Um, we validated it using the RISC-V test suite and by the comparison with the spike simulator, which is sort of the simulator developed by the sort of RISC-V people. So some of the people in that really long author list at the start, they're involved in the RISC-V sort of process and some of the working groups. Uh, so we've sort of contributed back into the RISC-V development. Sort of developing a formal specification kind of shed some light into bits of the specification that aren't really fully sort of uh, described. So there were some things that were ambiguous in the specification of interrupts, in the page table walks. And some, when we were doing our trace comparison, we found sort of bugs in the spike simulator. And the other thing we've done with RISC-V is we've integrated into the RMM concurrency tool. So there's sort of 6,847, I believe, number of changes every now and again, uh, litmus tests that are used actually to develop the RISC-V model. And our model in sale has the same behavior or the expected behavior on those litmus tests. So we also have this MIPS and Cherry MIPS model. And what's really interesting here is that from our perspective, it's a really um, successful example of what I would call sort of hardware software semantics co-design. So we work with the Cherry people at Cambridge. And what's really nice about this is that this model is sort of owned and developed by the hardware researchers themselves. Um, and so they're using it in the upcoming Cherry, I think, V8 specification document, like I mentioned earlier. OK, so this is just the one slide I have on sale, the language, because I don't have that much time. Um, so what is SAIL? Well, it's an imperative first-order language for describing ISA specifications. It's kind of cliche to say, but one of the things we try to do is to keep it as simple as possible, but no simpler than it can be. But we do have some dependent types. So we have dependent types for um, bit vector widths, because when you have these large specifications, it's very easy to make kind of off-by-one errors. So having some dependent types can really help there to make sure those errors don't happen. Um, what we do in the paper, so if you want to look at more details of the type system, uh, you can look at the paper. We have a fragment of the language, which we call mini sail. And for that, we've proven some important properties. So we use an SMT solver um, to uh, use for the bit vector widths in the dependent types. So we prove decidability for that. And we prove type safety as well. So, so if you remember the picture I had at the start, I had all the instruction set architectures at the top. I had our language in the middle. And then I had at the bottom all the different use cases. So one of the use cases is we generate emulators. We need to generate emulators that are reasonably fast in order to boot operating systems in our model. So we have a few optimizations. And this is also where the having dependent types kind of comes in handy. Because as a specification language, we want to be as high level as possible, right? So we use arbitrary precision bit vectors, arbitrary precision integers in our specifications. But then we use our dependent types to kind of figure out where if those things can fit into sort of machine words and optimize them in that way. And we have a few other simple optimizations that mean we can get up to about, so that's not a typo, that is about one MIPS for MIPS and about 
80,000 instructions per second for ARM, which is enough to boot Linux on ARM in about 10 minutes, uh, which isn't too bad. You can even bisect um, sort of kernel patches, and it just takes a few hours. So maybe what's more interesting for uh, sort of the popular audience is we want to be able to generate theorem prover definitions. So like I mentioned, we're targeting all these different provers. Uh, we have two different ways of setting up our definitions at the moment. So we have a sort of a simple state monad for sequential reasoning. And then we have, like I mentioned, we can do this concurrent reasoning. So we have a free monad over memory effects uh, for dealing with concurrency. And again, here, we try to use our type information. So we have a simple language but with a sort of slightly more interesting type system. And we use that so we can try to nicely integrate uh, with machine word libraries in Isabel Hull. So we know kind of, so the machine word library in Isabel Hull lets you specify sort of exact bit widths. And we can use our dependent type to kind of match nicely into that. And we try to validate this translation into theorem provers by sort of testing. So we do code generation from the models in the theorem provers and then try to run the test suites on them, although that is extremely slow. So it's not um, practical in all cases. So, so we have this large specification. And there's a kind of a key question that you might be asking is if you have, you know, 100,000, 60,000 lines of specification, can you actually prove anything about it, right? So what we decided to do was we took the most complicated part of the ARMv8 model. And in previous ver versions of these slides, I was like, it's sort of maybe the most complicated version. But then the ARM people were like, no, 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 it's the most complicated. So the address translation, just to specify it, takes about 9,000 lines of the specification. Uh, the page table walk itself is a single function, about 500, uh, 500 lines of source. And then it, that's not including all the various helper functions for the page table walk, and there are a lot of them. Um, so it involves sort of all the awkward squad that makes proving things about this kind of stuff difficult. So there's iteration, variable length bit vectors, memory effects, non-determinism, et cetera. So what we did was we took all that, and we defined a sort of simple characterization of the address translation in RMV8 which was suitable for reasoning about non-system code. So if you're not in, in the context of like an operating system, if you're just writing ordinary user-level programs, this is kind of what you'd think of as address translation. So user mode, no virtualization, valid translation tables. The hardware is going to deal with updating the translation table flags. And we proved that our simple characterization is equivalent to the, to the full ARMv8 uh, address translation. And one of the interesting things about this is we uncovered a few small bugs in the ASL code. So there was a missing endianness reversal in one case, and there were a couple of other cases where it was slightly too non-deterministic due to things not being defined in quite the right way. OK, so I think I'm running out of time. So to conclude, what we've done is we've developed these rigorous semantics for real production architectures, uh, complete with system features. And I think there's sort of many, many exciting verification projects that are you know, hopefully of interest to the public community that are enabled by having such specifications available. So all our specifications are available under permissive BSD licenses. They're all available on GitHub. So you can go on GitHub. You can download them. Uh, the concurrency stuff I briefly talked about, um, that's also open source and on GitHub. Um, so if you're interested, uh, feel free to go check it out. And thank you very much. OK, we have very many questions on Slido, so let's start from that. Uh, the most popular one is as follows. What's worse, language specifications like C11 or instruction set architecture specifications? Ooh, that's the tough question. Um, well, we're going to have a talk on C next, so maybe people can watch both talks and decide for themselves. Um, I, I would personally say like C language specifications, but I quite like instruction set architecture. So maybe I'm biased. <laughs> I don't know. Audience? Ah, go ahead. Shout. So it's interesting to me that you want to have some kind of fancy type system to prevent bug in the specification. Mm -hmm. So this raises the question of what's a bug in the specification, and can you specify the specification? Right. So that's, that's a really interesting question. Because the specifications are so large, you really do have to test your specification and validate your specification. Um, I don't know if you could really have a specification, a meta specification, but yeah, it, it's a real problem, like having bugs in the specification. But you can test it against the implementation, I guess. Yeah, we can test it against the implementation. We test our ARM specification against ARM's version of the same specification to kind of make sure they match up. Um, 
we run like small lit, you know, litmus testy style programs to make sure it kind of does sensible things. But yeah, for, at this size of specification, it, it is a real problem. All right. Next question is anonymous. Why is the concurrency model not a part of instruction set architecture spec? Um, so there's probably uh, people on the author list who are more well equipped to answer that question. Um, but I think in general, the, the concurrency model is sort of saying like what happens when, when you talk to memory. So like if you access memory, like whether you get sort of, you know, it's all about kind of the caching and stuff in the processor. It's not actually about the instruction set architecture itself, if that makes sense. Maybe. <laughs> Audience, Philippa? Hi, so I loved the theorem at the end. Mm -hmm. So with the theorem at the end, what are you going to be able to prove with the simpler stuff and what can't you prove because it's actually, you need the huge stuff? Right, so yeah. the, the idea is that if you were, for certain applications, you, you don't always want to deal with the full complexity. So if you wanted to prove, if you were wanted to do something with just ordinary user mode code, like you're not writing a hypervisor or something, um, you don't need to deal with all the complexity of address translation. And you don't want to deal with that every time you do a memory access, right? So you want a simple characterization so you can say, uh, under these sort of sensible assumptions, this simple one's equivalent. So we can just use that instead, like when we're doing our proof with Isabel. That's kind of the idea of simplifying away this, with this detail. All right. So a uh, couple of questions from Slido that are sort of the same, from what I understand. Uh, what are the kinds of test failures you are still seeing against ARM test suite? Do you think reaching 100% is realistic or useful? Uh, I, I would like to get into the high, like 99.85 that we kind of had before. I don't know if we'll ever reach 100%. Uh, there's some things, so I don't always agree with the way ARM writes their specifications. They have one feature, one thing they do at the moment, which is they use sort of exceptions for control flow in their decode logic, which is really hard to translate. So we currently have some failures there. So in ARM, when in their specification, when you try to decode something, you might end up going into the decode tree, decoding something, it turns out to be the wrong thing. So then the ARM specification says, throw an exception back up and then try a different decode. And, and this decoding logic is very hard. And that's because they're trying to pack a lot of instructions into kind of a small 32-bit space. So that's something we don't translate very well at the moment. And it's causing some bugs for us. So I think some percentage of that 6% or so that isn't working on the V8.5 specification is caused by that issue. Uh, so when we address that, hopefully it'll go up. Uh, yeah. I have another question about uh, simplified semantics that was the subject of the earlier question. Do you have a systematic way of creating these simplified semantics, or is it slogging through your gigantic specification and somehow trimming it down uh, and then hoping you can prove a kind of theorem of the sort uh, that you yeah, had on, so on in, page In a 15. way, it was like it did involve, I think, a lot of domain knowledge, like it was kind of slogging through it. But we kind of knew sort of what the sensible assumptions that people would want are. Uh, so we were able to sort of say, well, you know, we're going to be in a specific exception level, and that's going to simplify away a bunch of cases. So if you're not in, so if, you're, if you don't care about hypervisor mode, then your address translation only has like one step. So only when you have a hypervisor do you do two different steps. So we is, knew is we could deal with a, one. Is example. there a way of structuring the specification so that these sorts of slices of the specification are easier to carry out? Uh, we have uh, our translation tool does let us like pull out slices of the specification, but not really in that way. Uh, like we kind of had to deal in Isabel with that full 9,000 lines or whatever. It was just the way it is. All right. Let's thank Alistair again.